welcome to the Surge Center. My name is Amanda Chaco. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship at Lakeshore Vantage. Lakeshore Vantage is the economic development organization for Ottawa and Allegan County, and we work with companies from startup through grown up, helping them to launch and grow. This is our business incubator, where we specifically work with product and technology startups, and we help them each of the stages of development, we have all types of resources and programs. So if any of you are starting a new company or you know somebody that is, please send them our way. But we are here today to learn about the trends in um, social media for 2024. So I'm very excited to learn that. And Rivka is the executive director for, wait for it because I have to read it. <laughs> Um, the Michigan Association of Conservation Districts. Um, but she also has her own company um, where she helps individuals and businesses with social media and strategy. Mm -hmm. And I'll let Rick take it away. Thank you, Amanda. Welcome. I'm really excited to be here. And one of the challenges always in doing a presentation about social media is that it is so unique to the goals purpose and structure of your organization. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk for like 45 minutes and talk about some of the big trends happening in social media, some of the tools I'm using, and some of the things that I see coming up on the horizon. But we'll leave plenty of time so you guys can ask your own individual questions. And we can talk about application and say, how does this apply to what the challenges are that you're facing in your organization, um, specific content ideas for for your goals and all of that kind of stuff too, because it is so specific stuff. Um, one of the things I like to say about social media is everything changes and everything stays the same. So the technology changes, but fundamentally when you're talking about social media, you're talking about communicating with other people. And humans are actually pretty stable, like more so than we like to think. Like we like to think we're evolving and changing and growing. Um, but the reality is we're kind of hardwired a particular way. We all have the same cognitive biases. We all have the same motivating factors with some variation for language, culture, et cetera. Um, and so understanding that behavioral psychology and understanding how to build relationships with other people is the foundation for all your social media efforts. And if you can keep track of that, you will always be ahead of the curve. You know, there are things that people were saying or doing five years ago, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I first started doing social media, that you know they would get very, very obsessed, for example, with understanding all of Google's latest algorithm. And I was saying a decade ago, if you continue to write for people, you will rank higher and higher and higher because Google's entire business model is to get better at delivering people what they want. And that's true of social media as well. Facebook, TikTok, X, <laughs> formerly known as Twitter, um, all of them, they survive or fail based on how good they are at delivering what people want and keeping them on the platform. So if you focus on your connection to people, you will always outperform regardless of any trends, regardless of any technology, and any changes that happen over time. And a lot of what we're going to talk about today is just further reinforcing that. The technology is just getting better at understanding our brains and sometimes kind of creepy ways and we'll leave the social scientists to talk about whether that's a net positive or a net negative but we all contribute to the ecosystem that exists on social media and we can do our part to make social media a better place to be that improves the world so i did not do a whole presentation because i thought this would be more helpful rather than saying I've got all this information on slides and have everybody be like, can you send out the slides? And then have Sophie send out the slides and then they go into the bottom of your inbox and you're like, I need to look at those sometime and do something about it at some point. So you have a paper, which I know is not like, could happen, the same thing could happen. I highly recommend you take your phone and you snap a photo because then you will have it in your pocket all the time. I do that anytime there's printed information that I need to save and refer to it often. There's three major trends that we're going to talk about today. Content and the changes in content, AI, and how that's impacting content development, 
Um, and then authenticity or connection, kind of diving deeper on that person-to-person -person element of social media. So here's some interesting statistics. 90% of content marketers use websites and blogs as their primary content strategy. Problem, most of the content that is, ranks as top performing, highly engaging, actually gets results, is not blogs and written content. So 59% of top performing content is video of one kind or another. About 30 to 40 percent of that is short form video. About another 15 to 20 percent is like podcasts, interviews, other or long form video, and that kind of sorry, podcasts disregard are long form videos and other types of videos. Um, after that 59 percent huge chunk of every type of video created online, another 33 percent of the top performing content is podcasts, interviews, memes, user generated content. So. Even if you're not great at math, like me, 59% plus 33% is pretty close to 100. And you're not wrong. Like only about 6% of highly performing content is blogs and writing content. If you were going to create blogs and written content, this includes even things like X, short, even short written content, it has to be very, very high quality in order to make a difference. This is only going to increase with AI-driven content because people perceive it's really easy now. We can go into ChatGPT, churn out 20 blogs for our website, publish them, and ta-da, we did a thing. But <laughs> most of the internet is just junk that's not meaningful, doesn't move the needle, doesn't help us progress. We don't need to add to the pile of junk. We need to create meaningful, high quality, helpful content. And that is what will get your business noticed, you as an individual noticed, is what will move you forward on any real measurable, measurable objective. Because we're no longer, we never should have been, but if we have been, we're no longer doing social media just to check a box and say we did a thing, right? It has to be tied to a deeper business objective we have to be clear on what is the action we want people to take after they consume this content. And if you don't know the answer to that, your users definitely are going to know the answer to that. <coughs> so, talking about this trend, what does that mean for you? Some major bullet points, quality over quantity, like I said. Podcasts, I know we all joke about podcasts, and I apologize to the men in the room, but especially as women, you need to start making podcasts. Okay, um, like just statistically, I'm just saying. Um, podcasting tends to be dominated by a very specific genre, but podcasts are a really powerful tool. Again, it's people connecting with other people. You hear so much more in the inflection of my voice and the details of what I'm saying when you can hear me speaking than you would if you read this exact same information in a blog post that I put on LinkedIn. Right? which also blog posts on LinkedIn are still good. We're not saying don't do it. <laughs> but if you have the capacity to do alternative media like podcasts, short form videos like TikTok, long form videos. But the other thing is like maximize the content you are creating. So if you're taking the time to create a podcast, you didn't just create a podcast. You just created a podcast you created a whole lot of short form video content. You probably created some long form video content. You also created a blog post because you can pretty easily run that into a transcript, edit it, add subheadings, right? So now it's deliverable across mediums on whatever way is best for people to use. Um, and you're not having to reinvent the wheel, right? Short form video content does not mean you have to sit and think of 30 different two minute long challenges <laughs> to do on TikTok, right? It can be trends, it can be those things, but it can also be pieces of longer form content. If you were going to write a blog post and it was gonna be a list of tips, every single one of those tips is really easy to break down into short form content. You also, some of the big objections that I hear to people when um, about video content, I don't like to be on camera. 
first of all, it's a really important skill and it is a skill, you can learn it, right? It is something you can develop and work on even if you don't feel confident. You know, some, some easy hacks are, you know, put a picture of somebody that you really, really like behind your phone and look at that person and talk to them. That can help reduce some of your nerves, right? There are all kinds of different ways that we can hack our brains. And it's gonna be, in, in some cases, as unique as you are. Identify what the obstacles are. Too often, we're really quick to be like, that feels uncomfortable, that feels not fun, I'm just not gonna do it. We don't get farther than that. And we need to start asking ourselves those deeper questions. What about making short form video content is uncomfortable? Is it about being on camera? Is it about trying to come up with content? Is it about editing? I don't know how to edit. All of those are solvable problems, okay? It's 2024, you gotta do video. Well, like, I'm sorry to say, that's just like the bottom line. We can sugarcoat it all day long, but if you want to really have an impact on social media, you're gonna have to figure this out. You don't, also, you don't have to be on camera, right? You can use uh, any of uh, many, many, many screen capture tools, do a video tutorial you can do a slideshow you know for a very long time I I felt awkward about being on camera which is always kind of funny to me because an in-person thing like this is I've been comfortable with since I was like this tall my dad took me to his Toastmasters when I was like eight and I wanted to participate and this will totally date me but they had like a they had a little hat with like pull out a random topic. I pulled out Mike Tyson. This was right around a certain ear incident that those who are older in the room will know what I'm talking about. I had no idea who this human was and I just made up a speech about Mike Tyson on the spot. And I was hooked on public speaking from that point on. <laughs> I do not, because YouTube was not a thing back then. <laughs> like, thank goodness, as an elder millennial, all of my foibles were not recorded. <laughs> And post it for posterity's sake. Um, so there are, you know, I was like, I don't want to be on camera. I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to spend a bunch of time editing. Doing screen capture tutorials were great. And honestly, we're more helpful than people just staring at my face anyway. They want to learn how to use this tool. And it can be really helpful to say, click here, do this. Even if it seems so obvious to you, the people who are not in your field, it's not obvious to them. They can already tell, right? You know, conservation work. You can take videos that have nobody in them. You know, you can do a video showing uh, the invasive species that you're working on, showing the trees, showing, right, show, 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 show. If you had somebody with you, physically with you, what would you show them that would be interesting, right? You probably, if I have somebody over to my house and I want to talk to them about a book that I love, I'm probably going to walk over to the shelf and pick it up and hand them, it to them to leave through. I'm not going to tell them to just imagine it. Like we do this naturally, intuitively. Again, if you can understand how people work and you can see the technology as a system, this is something uh, AI talk they have here at the Surge is great. We were talking about this in relation to chat GPT. The problem is we see a lot of technology as this external thing outside of ourself. Technology when it's working its best is assistive meaning it makes us better. It makes us stronger, faster. The top performing race car drivers don't think of their car as a separate piece of technology that they're using from a fundamental biological level, they see that vehicle as an extension of themselves. And it's how they can drive so fast. Because they're not having to process the space between them and the car, they and the car are one thing. And there's actually a lot of really interesting research about how that functions on a neuro level that we don't have time to get into, but yes, I'm a nerd, I know, that's funny. <laughs> um, I'm a nerd who's worked in content creation for like 17 years. Um, so I've read everything you can possibly, any topic you can throw at me, I probably know some random fact <laughs> relevant to that. We have to start seeing our phones, our computers, AI as extensions of ourselves. How can it improve 
what I'm doing, my workflow, how can I utilize the way my brain works and use these tools to make you better, faster, smarter, more intuitive, more caring, more kind, uh, more authentic. That is the dream of technology. It's not that it exists separate from us. We don't have to worry about robots taking over the world if we're like, one with robots. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, so video, you just got to do it. Make your content shorter in general. Here's another interesting statistic. So like five years ago, top rated blog posts on Google averaged about 2,300 words. Now, top rating blog posts on Google averaged 1,447 words. Cool. You have to condense. There's not room for fluff. We don't need to talk about things for five minutes that we could say in one. We don't need to write about things in five paragraphs that we could say in one. Take the time to edit. Take the time to write it, set it aside, and come back to it and say, is there any parts of this that are duplicative, that don't make sense, that could be said in a shorter, better way? Have somebody else read it and see what their takeaways are. When, for big companies, right? When they're investing money in content development, there is a really clear correlation between how much they're committing resource-wise per piece to their results. We are not, churning out 100 blog posts is not going to help you. That kind of was true for blips at a certain point in time in the past. As the tech caught up, the tech has caught up and will continue to get even better and better. Quality over quantity. Has anybody seen the YouTube video of the guy who does the, the uh, he's a former NASA scientist, and he did this video of like this obstacle course for the squirrel, yeah. <laughs> right? Okay, yes, thank you. This guy has millions and millions and millions of subscribers on his YouTube channel. I think he produces 12 videos a year. Like that flies in the face of everything we're told all the time about content, that it's just like, keep churning it out. If you can produce stuff, that's, now I'm not saying you should only do 12 videos a year. I'm not, not saying we can, and <laughs> I'm not saying we can all be him. Like his stuff is, he's a NASA scientist. He's definitely like top tier brain going on. But we can definitely be more mindful about the content that we are creating and recognize more is not necessarily enough. Um, refresh and repurpose your existing content. If you have been creating content for a long time, go back through. Start there. Don't even create anything new. Go back through what you already have and say, do I have a blog post that could be turned into a video or a podcast episode? Do I have social media content that could be updated with better graphics now that the technology for creating this is better than it was 10 years ago? or updated content? Do I have a how-to article or a list of resources that's outdated? Where like, here's like the top 10 tools to use for designing graphics. If you wrote that article 10 years ago, I'm guessing it's probably a different set of tools today, right? So we can go back, use what we've already created as a jumping off point, save ourselves a whole ton of time, mental load, and effort of trying to generate ideas and come up with new stuff, improve it, make it better because we're better, we're smarter, the technology is better, the technology is smarter, and meet the needs of the people who are consuming it. Um, couple tools down here, I put video.ai. Video this is a tool, that's, if you've done long form video content, it's an editor specifically to break up that long form video content into short form video content. It's got a ton of templates, where it'll put titles and captions, and you can do side-by-sides if it's an interview. Um, CapCut, obviously, if you're doing cap TikTok videos. I know that's a free option, and everybody has a tendency. This is one of our kind of advices that we discussed earlier. <laughs> we have a tendency to see free and be like not valuable, and th that's just not the case. It's just not. Yeah. Um, sometimes free tools really are the best tool that's out there. Use it. You're really good at it and make it work. Um, and Canva, we were, I was just having this discussion with Beth earlier, <laughs> like there is kind of this still lingering perception 
that things like Canva are less than for design because Adobe was the gold standard for so long. Canva has caught up and in some aspects is better. Canva has embedded image alt tags. Canva has AI assist on both their graphics and their text. Take the time to really use that tool and learn its features because it has so much more capacity than most people realize. Canva particularly, they do about like a once a month webinar of like what's new in Canva. I always try to attend when I can, or if not, I at least review the slide deck so that, because they're continuously developing new features. So content is the first trend. The second trend is AI. We can't like be at the search center and talking about social media trends and not talk about AI. Um, AI is a, a, a big deal. Amanda and I have had a lot of detailed conversations about just the ethics of AI and using AI in your content generation and what counts as something you have to say this was created with the assistance of AI and what do you not. The reality is AI is far more embedded into our systems already than we even think about. It's not just ChatGPT. If you use Grammarly, that uses AI. If you use Gmail, it uses AI. If you use Boomerang, uses AI um, <laughs> and that's only going to continue to be more and more true um, I'm gonna give you a couple hacks as far as how to create helpful prompts that will actually get you useful results it's only as good as the prompts you put in if you ask a 10 this is like the opposite of what we just said I know we just said like less is more AI is also still kind of dumb it's still learning <laughs> like we have to provide way more inputs because it doesn't have a whole lifetime of experience that it already has in its brain it has whatever it's read on the internet and as we've already previously discussed the majority of the internet is junk um, and so it's still trying to figure out what's valuable and what's not and you can tell it um, one thing that vastly improves your results, you'll see this first prompt, you're a content creation expert. This is, you can write this to you. If you tell ChatGPT that it's an, an, an expert in subject matter, its response is improved. If you are nice to ChatGPT, its response is improved. If you say please, its response is improved. It's because the data that it was trained on was created by humans. So if you go into a Reddit thread and you're really nice about the questions you ask, you get better responses. It's not that, like, I'm not saying AI has emotions. I'm just saying it's mimicking our human behavior, including things like how we respond to politeness, the difference between an expert opinion versus a non-expert opinion. So when you keep that in mind when you're writing your props, it will make a difference in what gets spit back out. I didn't include it on here, but another thing, especially if I'm starting at the beginning of a project, I'll give it as much information as I can, and then I'll say, what else do you need to know from me in order to help me with this? And sometimes, actually quite frequently, that gets me as far as I need to go on a project, because it'll give me a bunch of questions that I don't have the answer to. <laughs> So I can then go back to the client and be like, I need a budget for this, and I need this for this, and I need an answer to what your goal is for this, and then we'll, we'll circle back, <laughs> right? So those things make a difference. The other thing that I feel like I have to bring up anytime AI is discussed at all, relevant to, it's learning from us. That all of us in this room need to be just deeply aware of, if nothing else, is the fact that AI, like all other tech, has the capacity to duplicate the best of our society and the worst of our society. There are some really great books, um, uh, Automating Inequality by Virginia uh, Eubanks, I think. I know the title for sure, I'm not sure of the name. Weapons of Math, M-A-T-H, Destruction by Kathy O'Neill. Um, and there are several other great books on the topic. Because primarily, especially in the United States, especially in Silicon Valley, there's only a small subsection of our human population creating all this technology. All of those biases, opinions, are being embedded in the systems. And we have to pay attention to that. And we have to pay attention to the ways that that's influencing what's spit back out at us 
and take the time in self-reflection to put our best frontal lobe thinking in action <laughs> to try to counteract those biases and systemic inequality and systemic racism that exists in every system we have so that we can try to mitigate damage from that and make the world better one prompt at a time. Um, but that's just something else to be deeply aware of is the fact that, the, that those biases do exist and are embedded in these systems and to watch out for them. And if you haven't invested in your own DEI training as an individual person, I highly recommend it. Because again, people are interacting with people. We only will create things that are as good as we are. So we need to be better all the time, improving ourselves, growing ourselves. The fact that you're here is a great sign, right? Because it means you're committed to lifelong learning, which is like half the battle, is making that commitment to the fact that I'm going to continue to learn, grow, and improve as a person for my entire life. Um, so next prompt, write me a list of five content ideas. I always ask for multiple when I'm asking ChatGPT because primarily I'm using this as like an interactive prompt for myself, right? Like this is, this is uh, an assistant that is never tired, never cranky, never drunk, <laughs> never too busy for me. Right? And I am an external processor. I am a person who needs to be able to bounce my ideas off and get feedback to generate my best thoughts. So honestly, that's a huge way I use ChatGPT is just to accommodate my neurospicy ADHD brain. <laughs> um, again, seeing these technologies as assistive to us to make us better rather than as an external assistant that we're like, pushing off the work to. So I always ask for multiple ideas for insert type of content with goal of insert. That second part is the key part of that prompt. Is your goal more engagement? Is your goal more views? If you're asking for YouTube video ideas, give me a list of five ideas that will help me um, get the most views possible will give you very different results from give me a list of five video ideas that will get me the most conversions possible or direct the most people to my website possible. <clears throat> what is it that you're trying to do ultimately? So I started working on utilizing this for some of my course development. And I'm like, I had started with my entire background. I was like, here is who I am as a person. I've been doing this and this and this and this for this long. And I want to create courses that will generate this amount of revenue in this amount of time. <laughs> what are the best topic ideas to accomplish that goal? Because that's a really different ask than just saying the stuff that's going to have the highest search engine results, right? So the more clear you can be on your goal, the better your results are going to be. With you. Um, create a social media content calendar that includes, again, this is like expand. Think about your purpose, think about your parameters, so include your parameters. So is it a daily post? Is it X, you could even be as specific as say, create me a monthly content calendar for one short form video a day that includes 20% humorous content, 20% informational content, 5% promotional content, right? The more parameters you can give it, the better results you're gonna get back. And regardless of what you get back, do not ever copy, paste, publish. <laughs> like, you have to read it, you have to review it, ideally with either a second set of eyes or with some space for yourself, right? Create it, set it aside, come back, review, then publish. So you have that time to think it through. Our, like, our brains are subconsciously processing millions of bits of information all the time. There's a reason that expert test takers will say, read through your notes before you go to bed and go to sleep before you take a test. It's because even when we're not actively thinking about it, our own processing systems are working on this. Try to give yourself the space to allow that to happen and you'll get better results. Um, give me alternatives too. So if you have five ideas, you can say, um, give me five more ideas. Or 
give me five more ideas, but make them blank. Or instead of this goal, achieve this goal, right? Swap it out and play with those prompts. Do some back and forth. It's like you're not getting charged per query, right? <laughs> like spend the time to have a real conversation with your AI to try to dig deeper. Um, sometimes you will get some, un so I, I was making my Thanksgiving menu. Um, I really love to cook and Thanksgiving is more or less just an excuse for me to just spend like four days cooking and baking. Um, so I have a spreadsheet, I carry the spreadsheet forward from year to year, I adjust and update, it has link, it's linked out to all of the recipes that I like to use, and coordinated with a shopping list, and again, very. Um, <laughs> this year I was like, I feel like I'm forgetting something, I'm like, I know, I'll ask ChatGPT. This is how we ended up with 15 pies for Thanksgiving. <laughs> because I put it in, I was like, here's my menu. And they're like, this menu was really, I wasn't gonna make pumpkin pie. They're like, this menu is really great, but we noticed that you've excluded pumpkin pie, which is a traditional pie. And some people would be upset if there was not pumpkin pie. <laughs> so anyway, ChatGPT and I had some conversation. And, and then I was like, I put, mocktails and cocktails and they're like you should provide an alcohol free alternative and I was like mocktails are an alcohol free thank you for letting me know <laughs> <laughs> so how to use this trend take the time to train your AI you know custom GPTs were at the very beginning of that that is only going to increase they just opened the GPT store so there are now, anytime they just introduce a thing, it's the wild, wild west. It means there's gonna be some really great GPTs out there and some really terrible ones of people who are just throwing content out there to monetize as quickly as possible, right? So use your discretion. This is worth taking time to learn. And I know this is, like I said, I've been doing social media for a long time and there's always some new thing. Right, it's like this new platform, do I need to get on threads, do I need to, like get on Google Plus, do I need to, you know, I mean, I'm sure there are ones like that, if I were to even say it would be like, oh yeah, that was a thing, right? <laughs> so it's always the question of like, what's worth my time to invest learning when it could be a flash in the pan and it could be gone. AI and assistive AI technology is not going anywhere. Like I said, it's already embedded in every big player in the tech space. Microsoft, Google, Meta, that will only increase. So this is like typing, okay? Like typing is a really good skill to have these days. Like sometimes I work with boomers who like are still hunting peckers, but they, they're, they're making their life real challenging because they have not felt the need to invest the time to learn how to type. Controversial opinion, I think typing classes are way more important than cursive for kids in school. <laughs> if you want to fight me on that later, we can. We'll do it during this presentation. And also have an art class, because people will be like, by motor, dexterity. Yes, that's what art is for. Like, give them an art class, which will be something they can create and love and enjoy, and then teach them typing. Teach you cursive, but anyway, I'll fight you on it later if you want me to. Um, so take the time to train your AI. Get clear on your brand voice. Again, input out is only as good as input in. If you don't know what your brand voice is, you will not be able to communicate it to AI or anybody else. If you don't know what is my tone, how much do I swear, uh, <laughs> like, a am I the type of am I the type of brand that is all about like pushing you through tough love, or am I like that very comforting, loving, like, if you just do X Y Z, it'll be so good for you, right? All of those are necessary. There's no right or wrong answer to communication style. This is all amoral. We sometimes assign morality to things that don't actually have inherent morality. Like, as long as you are not spreading misinformation and being mindful and conscientious about what you're doing, you're probably fine. But pay attention to what your brand voice is and what you're trying to do. And then use multiple tools don't get too attached. So I use ChatGPT4 all the time, but I also have Grammarly installed, 
And let me tell you, Grammarly is, and its AI tools are very, very helpful in helping me edit and clean up what comes out of ChatGPT4, right? Um, find the tools that work for you. These are what I use, like literally, I have probably ChatGPT, Canva, and Grammarly opened on my computer 24 seven, all the time. Um, all right, last one, How, where are we at on time? 12.09. Great, all right. We'll try and go through this fast so we leave time for questions. Um, again, this doesn't seem like a social media trend, but I promise you it is. <laughs> Connection really, really, really matters. Depending on your age demographic, for people under 30, they trust social media as just about as much as they trust national news media organizations. And even for older generations, that is true. Now that can be great, that's a lot of upsides, because I I am a big fan of removing the middleman and person-to-person -person communication. It's great and it's one of the best promises social media has to offer is to take us out of this mass media, which really is a blip on the human time scale. Like there's a whole there's a whole YouTube video about social media in ancient Greece. And like the fact that there used to be these town hall flyer boards and it was like the same thing we do on Facebook but it was all person. Like people would have their servants like run and then post notes and then people would go copy the notes and run it back to the house and then like get their thoughts on the notes and then run it back to the town square. Okay, <laughs> like we've been doing this for a real, again, everything changes and also it doesn't. Like our brains, we as humans have worked the same way more or less for thousands of years. Brain evolution is a very slow process. Technology moves way faster. So that being said, that's like the best promise of social media is facilitating that person-to-person -person real contact. The problem is we're not all good actors. People are coming to the table with agendas and are sometimes willfully providing false information for profit or otherwise. Um, again, we all have this responsibility as individual content creators, even if we're just posting on social media for ourselves only, to improve the world, because our collective action matters. It's a fundamental belief that I hold. Again, if you disagree with me, we can fight on it later. I care way more about that than cursing. Uh, <laughs> um, that trust must be earned. You can also lose it real, real fast. And it's hard to earn back trust once you've lost it. Um, I was at an event last week and one of the speakers said something that I think will stick with me forever and ever. Progress happens at the speed of trust. And that just like connected with me so deeply. You cannot make progress on your goals, either as an individual or an organization or even collectively as society, if there is not trust there. So. What does that mean? Fact check. Please fact check. Um, I mean, there are a couple of memes floating around. One I yesterday was posted by someone I'm really close to, and I know exactly where she stands on all the things, and the meme itself was not too problematic, but the source of the meme was incredibly problematic, and I just sent her a private message. I was like, FYI, this source is XYZ. I know you are not aligned with that. So I thought I'd give you a heads up, you might want to do it, right? It's part of, some of this can be solved by us just creating our own content, right? Like if we're not relying on quotes from other people, memes from other people, sources from other people, that if we can't speak to the quality of that person's character, right? Like I don't share a lot of other people's generated content for myself personally, because I feel like if I'm sharing their content, I'm also promoting them unless I feel real confident about that person or organization. That's not a bunny trail I won't go down, right? Um, be quick to correct your errors. If you mess up, please, 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 don't just go delete it and pretend like it didn't happen. Somebody screenshotted it somewhere. People are talking in private messages behind your back about, oh my gosh, can you imagine what they posted? If the conversation started in the public realm, keep it in the public realm. Reply to comments 
issue a retraction. Now sometimes, maybe after you've had the conversation, you can hide it or delete it later. And obviously, if it's something really egregious and it's causing harm, then yes, delete it. But try to avoid just being like, we'll just pretend like that didn't happen. Because it did happen, it did happen. Take accountability for your actions, correct it to mitigate the harm that you caused and do better. That's it, it's fine, right? <laughs> like, we can internally grow our own skill of managing when we mess up, because we will. And I know that it can feel, that can be in and of itself a reason why people don't post them. That is one I have had to work a lot on and not creating or putting as many things out there as I know I should. Because when I have a conversation and people be like, oh my gosh, I wish you would like share this, write a post about this, do a video about this, have a course about this, because this would be really, really, really useful. And like, it is scary for me. And it's something I have had to work on a lot to be like, I might mess up and that's okay. And I will just hold myself accountable, apologize, mitigate harm, improve. That's all we can do. Because otherwise, the only people posting content are the people who don't give a flying, you know what, about their impact on the world or about anybody else. And that's why most of the internet is garbage. <laughs> right? So if we're not willing to take that risk ourselves and step up, we're just leaving the stage open for all the people who are saying stuff that don't know what they're talking about, that don't care about others, that don't care about their impact. Um, I highly recommend if you are an organization that you have a social media crisis and response policy. If something happens big in your world, in your industry or in the world at large, first of all, what types of events do we need to shut off our social media for? Right? I had a whole conversation with a client. This was after one of the many mass shootings. And it happened, happened to occur close to where they live. It's a distributed team, it's a national organization, but they felt it real hardcore. And they're like, do we need to turn everything off? Do we need, you know, and we've had to have a lot of internal discussions about what events on a local, national, or global scale warrant us turning off our social media. Because our, in this particular case, this organization has a specific audience and a specific mission to fulfill, and that mission and that audience still needs the help they're providing regardless of what else is going on in the world. So regardless of what wars are starting, regardless of what shootings are happening, and I'm sorry, this sounds like a downer, but it's just the reality, right? There are still people who need help and need the services that you provide. And it is a balancing act between being sensitive and aware and conscientious to your audience and still providing essential support regardless of what natural disaster, because those things are happening all the time and it's only gonna increase, right? Like climate change alone, we'll forget everything else. Climate change alone, we are just going to see more and more and more and more weather events, disasters in our lifetime on a scale we can't even really internalize right now. And it's already happening. As people who are running social media, that provides a huge challenge of how we mitigate that. That goes back to knowing your brand, knowing your voice, knowing your purpose, knowing your mission. If you know those things, you will be able to effectively create a social media crisis and response plan. Say, who needs to be notified? If somebody in your organization dies, if somebody in your organization is convicted of fraud, gets arrested, right? Some of these things, if you're a solopreneur, won't really affect you. Some of these things, if you have even a team of five or 10 people, I mean, I have seen people's social media go completely off the rails because someone within their organization was arrested. Now they've got to do crisis control. Everybody's talking about what happened and who did this and who did what, and they don't have any kind of idea how to make a response or who's responsible for making that response what they're gonna comment on, what they're not gonna comment on, that gets really hard. It's much, and that doesn't mean that this is gonna answer every single question. There will be things that come up that you don't have specifically addressed in your plan, but having a plan will get you much farther along the path to a rapid response than you would have otherwise. 
because in today's world, we do not have the luxury of taking a fortnight to decide how we're gonna write a press release. Like, the damage is done at that point. Um, and every year, I recommend doing this at least once a year in January, if you're a bigger organization, probably a quarterly, do a blank brand and platform review. Are all your logos correct? Are all your profile pictures up to date? Does your about section still say what you do? For those of us that are freelancers, solo producers, consultants, you know how we tend to shift around a little bit. <laughs> um, are you still attracting the people that you want to attract? Um, are you still even on the right social media platforms based on how the platforms have changed? Or do you need to adjust your strategy? Um, tools. Grammarly. Grammarly has a tone checker. Boomerang has a tone checker <laughs> that can see, see how your stuff that you're writing, if it's positive, negative, so you're not coming off in a way that you don't want to come off. Bot Sentinel helps you identify bots um, on Twitter. Emergent.info, FatCheck.org are both great for looking for misinformation. RetractionWatch.org is specifically for scientific papers and published information that has been later retracted because that happens in the world of science. If just because a study said a thing three years ago doesn't mean that that study probably was really legit, doesn't mean it's the most up-to-date information, retractionwatch.org. Invid is a Chrome extension that you can install that reviews videos for manipulation, editing, deep fakes. Um, uh, Tenai.com is an image checker. This is like a few key ones, there are tons more, but think about how you're gonna integrate those check policies again, like deep fakes are getting better and better and better and better. This is gonna, any content you don't create yourself to put out, you need to be checking in some way to validate it. Because otherwise you're putting your own reputation and that of your organization on the line. So we ended on kind of a somber note, but <laughs> <laughs> questions, thoughts, comments, um, anything that stuck out to you, they're like, this made no sense to me, Rivka, start over, or application, case study. I'm real good with on the fly so stuff. You said something about not posting other people's stuff, right? Yeah. This is starting out as a you know, junior market. Yes. So, I mean, what I was in college, you know, that my professor would yes. say something about content curation. Yes. Then some tools came out like uh, school books yes. and stuff. In order for you to establish your stance mm -hmm. in, in that area of expertise mm -hmm. it is uh, advice that you like publish other people's work. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are your stance on that? I mean, just don't it can be good. I, I would say you can publish other people's stuff as long as you feel confident that you can stand behind their credibility and reputation. So for me, like, news organizations are a big one, right? Anything from The Guardian, I have no problem sharing and republishing. Anything from Bridge, Michigan, I had no problem publishing or reaching. These are organizations that I've read a lot of their content, I'm aware of how they're organized, I'm aware of their values in the organization. Um, the 19th News, which is like a news a nonprofit news organization solely focused on women's issues, it's, it's the 19th or the 19th Amendment? 19th Amendment. Uh -huh. Like they're a nonprofit, I am a donor, right? So any of those, those businesses, because I've already highly vetted them, and they have credibility, I don't have a problem standing behind that credibility. Um, a random meme that somebody shares from some random Twitter account, absolutely not, right? Like unless it is a personal friend of mine that I have a close relationship with and I feel like I know their stances on most major issues and that we would align in areas that are really important to me, I'll reshare their content. Um, Organi nonprofit organizations that are doing really good work, that I'm deeply aware of their mission, their structure, and their values, I will reshare their content. Just remember that when you reshare, it doesn't mean you can't ever reshare content, but like things that are just randomly scraping the internet and spitting stuff out at you, those are kind of a red flag to me. And that used to be done a lot, and it still is done a lot because it's a fast, easy way to distribute a bunch of content. But again, even if it's a really great meme that I love the meme, if they click on who that original source is, where are they gonna go? What are they gonna see? Are they gonna assume that I'm also promoting that? 
So it's just about taking that extra, I have, for every single one of my clients, we have a curated list in our content calendar of trusted sources that we've already discussed. Do you, are this organization, this organization, this organization, this website, this blog. For each client. Mm -hmm. And I review that with the client. Like, are, these are all <coughs> sources that I feel like are trustworthy, aligned with your values, your mission, your purpose, your content. Do you agree? Yes, no. Then I know that I can go to those sources for content to share. Um, and it saves time in the long run. But, so that's what I mean when I say don't share. Like, first of all, be thought leaders. Come on, you guys. We all have original thoughts. We just, like, self-censor ourselves too many times. And I know that I literally, any of you who know me in this room really well know that I'm speaking from personal experience. <laughs> like I self-censor myself so much, so I'm not being like shame on you. I'm just like this is a collective thing we need to work on. <laughs> um, so be brave enough to be a thought leader and say the things. But if you're going to share information, just remember that you're attaching your reputation to theirs. And if you feel good about that, then go for it. So I'm standing behind the uh, regional partnership that mm -hmm. we might be in South America. Mm -hmm. And most of the stuff that was posted around uh, the business ecosystem, mm -hmm. I'm usually like, you know, I don't need mm -hmm. to add my, uh, I don't need to color mm -hmm. in my opinion, because I'm also a part of your content for communication, mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. and stuff. But these are also for development organizations. Yep. And I would still color it. I would still add, even when I share stuff from other people, I always add my two cents. And that is partly for that thought leadership piece, partly just because the algorithm's old feel like a real person touched this. So even if it's just to say, I love the work that this organization is doing. If it's a list of things, be like, oh, number three on here is something that I found really useful. Um, I'm so proud of XYZ that they're doing this work. Um, anything like, it doesn't have to be huge, but I would still, if you're sharing content, Spend a little time out of your two cents. Nice. So, yes. But that's another reason I just add that to it, right? So, yes. these are the stuff that's happening yep. in, in the mission area mm -hmm. and in the business ecosystem. Mm -hmm. so, so, cool. A lot of times that would be good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yep. Awesome. Um, yes. Basically, you take the time, just like you would train an assistant, you're taking the time to train the IE for, I, AI specifically for your needs. So you're just inputting all of this data about this is who I am, this is who I serve, this is what I do. Now, important note, nothing that exists on the internet is anonymous or private, but definitely nothing that exists in AI is anonymous or private. Absolutely, a chat GPT is scraping that learning from it and shit. So, if you are in a protected field, healthcare, government, um, be aware of that. That whatever you put in there does go into the beast. You never want to put patient names. You never want to put personal identifying information. You never want to put anything that's sensitive, anything that would be covered by an NDA. If you would not tell some, if you would not have a conversation with a friend, if you were just getting together with a friend to brainstorm and you wouldn't feel comfortable sharing it with the urgent state and acquaintance, and you wouldn't feel comfortable <coughs> sharing it with them because you're covered under an NDA and they're not, don't put it in the chat GPT or anonymize it in some way, right? So like medical related stuff, you can still put it in, but you would want to say like a male patient, 33, has such and such symptoms, blah, 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 blah. Um, some of those things will change and grow and adjust as the technology develops. The custom chat GPTs in the store are basically people <coughs> training AI for specific use cases and then they're selling you the work that they did to do that training. Yeah. If anybody's interested, our next AI talk is about just that. Yes, uh, and I'm not an expert in that, for sure. Yeah, real quick on that. So. <laughs> my night job, I'm a solopreneur. I love that term. Great term. I'm going to steal that. 
Um, but my day job, I work in computer security for a Fortune uh, 500 company. And we have to deal with that all the time mm -hmm. with potentially really sensitive information getting out. Mm -hmm. um, and so as I teach people how to use ChatGPT or the AIs, it's always anonymized, you know, like if they're going to ask, like for, for programming, for example, do not put the names of our servers on, do not put people's <laughs> names on, do not do put, not put passwords. So passwords on, numbers. all this kind of stuff. Put generalized information, and then when the, when the data comes back, you can then use that. It's a tool. It's not going to do everything for you. Modify it then for your needs. It's, it's so important. And and here here's one of my also big rules of thumb that I've said for years. When posting on social media, do not post anything you would not want your accountant, your lawyer, your insurance adjuster, or your mom to see. <laughs> or your dad. Because um, even when we post things secretly, there are no secrets on the internet. Yes. Uh, I work for a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. I've always worked for nonprofits mm -hmm. and small organizations. Mm -hmm. I usually do a combination of roles yep. marketing, mm -hmm. which under which social media tends to fall, uh -huh. but also development and also grant writing. So my amount of time available is very limited. Plus, where we are with this organization right now would be probably at the very beginning of this. I see that there is a box in Canva for me to write my brand voice. Mm -hmm. I haven't done that yet. So I'm just about step one. Yeah. Do you have any advice for how I would move forward? I see the sense of a calendar and a crisis response plan. Any, any thoughts mm -hmm. on, in that realm? Sometimes, if you have the budget for it, it can make sense to hire a consultant. And I know this seems like very self-serving because I'm a consultant. I'm not saying hire me. I'm just saying it can be helpful to have somebody help you set your strategy at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And it can be enough time savings that it makes it worthwhile to have a structure in place that you can then implement sometimes, mm -hmm. depending on if the budget exists. Right. Um, sometimes, if you're a nonprofit, some people will be able and willing to either give you a pro bono or a discounted nonprofit rate for that. Excluding that, excluding getting expert help to set your to set your parameters, um, don't overcommit yourself. Find a social media platform that makes the most sense with your audience and start there. You know, a lot of times people feel like I'm missing opportunity, I'm missing opportunity, I'm missing opportunity. There are 8 billion people on this planet. I guarantee you none of us has the capacity to serve 8 billion clients, customers, whatever tomorrow if they walked into our door, right? You can be very, very successful making deep, meaningful connections with only a few hundred people. Um, it's not all about having thousands or millions of followers. For most organizations, that's not going to actually move the needle in the way that they expect it to. It'll probably will just cause more headaches. So don't focus on getting those huge, huge numbers. Focus on what do we need to accomplish and what's the best way to do that and try to keep your scope yeah. limited. The other thing I would say is schedule time for it. And this is for you specifically, but anybody else is helpful for. As someone who also wears all the hats all the time, um, it's really easy um, to put stuff off and put stuff off that's important but not urgent. So put time on your calendar to do it. Create checklists for yourself of the most important things to do um, so that you can do it as efficiently as possible. Thanks. How much more time do I have, Amanda? Well, technically we have one. Oh, OK. Well, great. Fantastic. So Other questions? Yeah. Before I give up the stage, may I, I came late. Sorry. Can I see who else does non, who's working in the nonprofit field? Okay, thank you. Who um, does this for like their real job? Like you are literally trained to be a content creator? Okay, okay, good. Um, anybody else have to wear all the hats? Okay, good. I am in the right room. I thought everybody here knows how to do this and I don't know what's happening. Okay. Well, and I just, I did say, uh, I'm talking to Morgan, like, apologies, this is kind of like a 201 class right now. Like, there's definitely a lot more, like, 
foundational information. And you know, if you have other specific questions, you can definitely feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn is on there. You can send me a message, and I can shoot you some resources that will address those specific things. Thank you. Sorry. No problem. Mm, thank you. Um, I'm not all the hats guy. Yes. <laughs> um, trained as an engineer, but transitioning into a sales guy. Um, I have a startup where we sell primarily business to business. Um, and I've always thought of social media as a, like a sign of life, where they yes. find the website, they check out your social media. Yeah. yeah, they posted three years ago, come back and maybe buy the product. That's not a sign of life. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to assume you're dead. <laughs> like, if it's more than a month old, <laughs> like you're going to have a problem. So yes. And what, so. What's the additional kind of value prop to social media and like a business to business space? Mm -hmm. sales? So definitely sign of life. I would agree. I've never used that term mm -hmm. ever, but I would agree with that. It lets them know you're legitimate, you're active. Like websites, it's not always clear when it was last updated or how recent or relevant the information is because social media is time stamped. It gives them some idea. Um, again, three years is too long. <laughs> Um, that being said, the other thing for a lot of people, social media ends up being their first uh, first line of defense for customer service as well. If people have a problem, often they are more likely to go to LinkedIn or Facebook or wherever they're connected with and send a message that way than they are to send an email because they got to go through the extra step to find the email. To, I mean, even I will do this if I'm like, I'm not even 100% sure who should address this. If I just send it to their social, they'll figure it out and like move it to whoever it is. Um, so customer service. And business to business, LinkedIn rocks. Like LinkedIn is a the most underrated social media platform. Like it is where business happens. The user base on LinkedIn is completely different than the user base um, on other social media platforms. The majority of people on LinkedIn make over six figures. The majority of people on LinkedIn have higher level degrees. Like these are the decision makers and the people who are making business happen. So it can be a fantastic resource to connect to people, to create content, to be a thought leader, creating LinkedIn articles. You know, I mean, literally anytime if I want, if I need new clients for my business, I just post on LinkedIn for like a month and my schedule's full of things. <laughs> like because people see my stuff and reach out to me and they're like, oh yeah, Rebecca, I need help with such and such. I think I, mean, I want to echo that. I, it changes our business like that. Mm -hmm. so I'm like, oh, we're taking a dip. Just get on LinkedIn and go mm -hmm. purple. It's always amusing to me when people are like, how do you market your business? I'm like, doing the thing I'm telling you to do. <laughs> Same thing. Um, but yeah, LinkedIn is an incredibly powerful. Now, TikTok not necessarily going to be so useful for B2B right now. Mm -hmm. Like, but. Um, something else that a social media for business to business is a lot of press entities mm -hmm. are pulling information from your social media. Yep. So you've got something coming up, you've sent a press release yep. out, they're going to be watching your socials for more quotes and more yep. content. 100%. We've been seeing that a lot more with connections with the Sentinel and everything. And, and they may need, if they if they need a picture, a headshot, up, they might mm -hmm. not get a bio. They might not even bother contacting you. Just pull oh yeah, no, they won't. So again, make sure your stuff's up to date. Yeah. <laughs> well, just to piggyback off what you just said, I mean, we had um, uh, one of the local news reach out because on the January first, everyone was posting like Happy New Year, and so I had found something that said it was National Mentoring Month. And they reached out because they were like, hey, I was trolling for information and like new content and like everyone else's was kind of mm -hmm. old. Um, <laughs> and they were like, so we'd love to do an interview. And so got wow. to set up like a great PR. Like, yep. mm -hmm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's definitely a misnomer that social media is not relevant for b It's just different. Mm -hmm. If there's a customer that we're targeting mm -hmm. on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. Say it's like Spartan Nash or, or mm -hmm. Hudson Nash. Mm -hmm. um, do we ever say like, hey, Hudsonville, you got a lot of people in your freezers. Can we help them stay warmer? 
Or is that more of a direct I, message? I thing? mean, I would do it more of a, as a direct message usually. I mean, sometimes the, it just depends on whose desk it lands on. Sometimes that avant-garde kind of stuff will get your results. It'll sometimes be, it'll yeah. piss people off. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's it's just, I would say be true to yourself and your style and you will attract the right people to you. Everybody else will put you on block. Um, <laughs> But you um, found your community. Absolutely. <laughs> like when we try to make ourselves what we think people want, we do both us and them a disservice. Mm -hmm. Because we can't maintain that false persona and try to keep being all things to all people. When you're just like as authentically you as you can possibly be. Again, 8 billion people. I don't think we really can comprehend as humans what that B means and that number. So many people, there are other weirdos just like you that will be so excited to see a post like that, right? Um, now, um, that means that as far as attracting specific companies on B2B, the things that I would suggest, read their social media content. What are they posting about? What seems to be priorities for them? What are important to them? If you see something that you can amplify or help, if they post about a problem or something that you can specifically address, absolutely reach out and say, hey, I saw you posted about X, Y, Z. We have a solution for that if you want to talk, right? They may or may not, again, it's, it's a cold outreach. It's going to get whatever results it's going to get, but it's going to get way more results than if you just email them and are like, hey, do you need anything? Because you're showing that you're paying attention to them and you actually understand their needs. Um, amplify their content. Again, if it's a trusted resource, you can get on their radar just by continuously sharing their stuff. That's name recognition. They start to know who you are, depending on the size of companies. Like Spartan Nash, probably the social media person and the decision maker are two totally different people. But <laughs> um, you know, for legislators, like uh, for smaller organizations, for nonprofits, those people who are wearing all the hats, they will know who you are if you repost their stuff a few different times. Um, the, the other thing I would say is you can often, organizations will have who their employees are. Do you have any second degree connections that you can ask for a specific introduction? You know, like if I see that, you know, there's somebody at this company that also happens to be connected with Amy, rather than doing the cold outreach, I'm like, Amy, how well do you know this person? This is what I'm thinking, can you send me an intro and introduce me? That's gonna get you way farther than doing cold outreach. So just being able to see where those degrees of separation exist mm -hmm. can help you make a lot of progress. Any other questions? I don't know if I have a question, but based on like the bigger companies, we kind of go for some bigger companies too. I found a lot of progress when I figure out who their creative director is. Mm -hmm. And then big companies have an assistant to the creative director and getting out of their office mm -hmm. is like almost always a conversation. So, so like who's going to call the ultimate social media shots? It's going to be some sort of creative director. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. What are their problems? How can you solve them? Pain person points. to person. Mm -hmm. Again, circling all the way back around to where we started this conversation at, as we treat technology <coughs> and social media like it's some third thing. It's just another space that exists just like this space exists. Yes, Mia. What, what would you budget to have someone run uh, like TikTok for you? Totally mm. depends on the size of the organization, how many videos, what kind of assets you already have to work with. Are they gonna be starting completely from scratch or are they like repurposing what you've got? I would say anywhere from like $1,500 a month to $10,000. Oh, I have a question about that. I've noticed the marketing people that we just consult individually, it's they only do TikTok, they only do Facebook. Is that just the mm -hmm. normal now? There still are generalists who do all platforms, but because all of these platforms change so rapidly, um, there definitely is more specialization than there used to be. Like it used to just, and even, even outside, like when I first started doing this, like digital marketing was all one thing. If you did digital marketing, you did websites, you did advertising, you did social media, you did blogs. All of those have developed so much over the last few decades that they're definitely a lot more specialization. 
now it's like not only is it not specialized on websites but now you just have an SEO specialist you have just a UX specialist you have just a content specialist you have just a designer that are all collaborative and now again hats budgets size of organization like there's a lot of variation within that a lot of people who are just getting started maybe they do do all the things and they don't charge very much and they work for small organizations there is the, the like when it comes to people there is some truth to you get what you pay for right if there's somebody who is charging 10 percent of whatever other person in the marketplace is charging there's probably a reason that doesn't necessarily mean don't work with them because they're probably trying to gain experience and skills and everybody's got to start somewhere and that can be a great matchup for somebody who's just trying to get started and an organization that's just trying to get started but just know you're going to have some hiccups along the way that's okay as long as you just know that going into it and don't expect don't expect like ten thousand dollar results for a one thousand dollar budget yeah. um well again back to the i only have a sliver of time mm -hmm. what we've done is there's a front desk staff person who's mm -hmm. definitely like you know jenny mm -hmm. like younger than me everybody else at my organization older so i give them all the social media to uh -huh. schedule okay. because it's the program people who are writing like writing the content and i'm writing the development sure. content and all that stuff uh -huh. and then they schedule it yep. and then they're also monitoring like the yeah, comments and the sure. reactions and things mm -hmm. and, and responding so we've got that quick right. however i'm i'm thinking now about what you said is forming those relationships and that connection what do you think that there may be a problem with that person being disconnected. Like, I don't really know what they respond. I can go look mm -hmm. and I can see mm -hmm. what they respond. And if they have a question about, well, what do I say to this person who said X, Y, Z on Facebook? And I'm like, that's a, you know, go talk to that other program person. They know the answer to that one, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm, I can see where I could be disconnected. And how, does, does that matter? I don't know. So it can, it can definitely matter. You can miss a lot of opportunities because they won't see that it's important from a strategic, like they're, they're doing a checkbox for certain strategies. Sure. The two things I would say you can do to overcome that. Number one, policies. Structure can solve a lot of problems for you. So if you can identify, you know, just go back through messages for the last six months and say, what are some of the types of messages we've got? Mm -hmm. And you can say, if this then that, right? right? That you can train your the staff person on. Like if you have a question about this, I really want to know about this. Or it should be directed to so and so. Like creating that internal structure and those internal policies. The other thing is I'm not like I don't like micromanagement, but I'm also not a fan of everybody operating in silos with no coordination. So if you have multiple people who are touching that social media in one way or another, try to do a monthly social media meeting yeah. where everybody sits down you can talk about what's coming up for the month what events and programs you have how you can support each other um, so, yeah we just a work team mm -hmm. we do all yep. that we decide what's going to be done yep. we create our little do our little yep. sections and then it gets Good. scheduled so yep. i see all the content yep. it's in a single drafting document and but reports watching and reports. then the person reports back to me yes. so sounds like I got most of the bases covered but I should be going into meta myself mm -hmm. and like reading some of the things yeah that just so that you can have that training so that, that person knows what needs to be escalated or not escalated because they may not know that intuitively yeah. well, Thank um, you. is your younger desk person are they in the social media meetings um they can't make everyone because they're also a part-time student but at a minimum, they see the content drafting document yeah. um, and that has all of our topics and our awareness dates and, you know, what are we posting about? At least there's that. Cool. Um, yeah. Good thing. That's a good question. And I would say definitely try to prioritize getting them pulled in as much as you can because even if they see that document, not hearing the back and forth and, again, like the real live feed of, yeah, that they might have an opportunity to ask questions or something that they might not want to bug people. But if they hear, oh, well, what about such and such? Thank you. Yeah. Is there a tool that we can access where we could read about algorithm updates? Because I feel like overnight, like I, I did not change the type of content or the time, and I got like a quarter of the viewership or something to like the same type of post. So when that happens, it's like okay, 
I feel like I have to wait two weeks for someone to post about here's what I think changed. Like, is there a pulse There's not, for because can... this is all proprietary. Right, of course. Mm -hmm. Right, like these like... social media organizations are not trying to tell you what they're doing. Right. Um, <laughs> partly because of competitive advantage, etc. Um, I would say there are platform specific bloggers and people, you know, that I think, you know, have, like Kim Garst has a lot of great information about AI. Um, and Facebook. John Loomer is like one of the go-to experts on Facebook advertising specifically. So those people that specialize and have been creating content for a long time, they've got a pulse on it and you can follow that. Unfortunately, a lot of it is going to always be that kind of response and, and adjust. That being said, I don't know if you were in here at the very beginning, but I will say as long as you're continuously focusing on providing the best result for the people, the algorithms will continue to catch up. So yeah. you may have times where there's disconnect. Yeah. Algorithm updates, unintended consequences, things happen that things didn't expect. Yeah. As long as you're focusing on your audience and creating stuff that's really helpful, useful, and valuable to them, that will equalize again yeah. um, over time. Yep. And you know, it's just, it's a big, as much as we think of social media as this like very high pressure, fast, 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 it really is over the long term right. mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. I have a question with that. So how important, if we're focusing on writing for the people and connection, mm -hmm. where do keywords come into this? Do we have to care anymore? I mean, to some level, yes. But again, that's kind of a reflection of what are people, the, the whole point of keywords is what are people searching for? So the more you deeply understand what are people searching for and what are they trying to get at, you're gonna know those keywords intuitively. Now, that doesn't mean that there's not still a place for doing some of that keyword research, and utilizing the tools to figure out what the majority of people are using because you're going to think about what you're doing and a lot of it just depends on how in touch you are with your customer base. If you have been doing this for 20 years, you know exactly what questions they ask and exactly what words they use and your intuition is probably going to be better than Google's keyword research. If you're brand new and you don't really know what your customer is asking or what they're looking for, then yeah, use the tools and help have it help you figure it out. So it's not that keywords are not important. Um, it's just we have to change how we think about it a little bit. And if you're using a very specific word, hopefully it's going to add clarity to what you're writing too. You know, like you're not using a lot of keywords if you're writing really fluffy content. So it's not the keywords per se. It's the like end result. Yeah, I, I hope it didn't cover it specifically in the print one. <laughs> Sorry, but um, so I've had a lot of uh, success writing some uh, blogs on medium.com. Uh, I noticed you said like 6% of the time is covered in blogging and you know, over half of it is in video. Mm -hmm. What would be the benefit of me taking those blogs, or would it be beneficial for me to just simply take those blogs, take what I wrote, use that as a script for a video? Yep. Uh, <laughs> totally. Which I yeah. want to elaborate on, because I definitely did cover that. Like, and, yes. and then the yeah. second thing with that is I, I'm writing for a number of different media publications that are drastically different. Like one's for photography, one's for opinion articles mm -hmm. and such. Could I put all of those on the same YouTube channel or should I create multiple channels? So this is always, <laughs> always the tug pull of time, resources, energy versus specialization and focus, right? The more focused you can be, the more you're going to be able to connect with your ideal audience because just because you are posting about cooking and photography, for example, some people who like photography are gonna like cooking. Some people are gonna be like, I came here for photography tips. I don't care about your queso recipe, <laughs> right? Um, and it'll get them to tune out. So, but you have to balance that with you, you only have so much time and energy, right? So what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? Who are you trying to reach? What do you want them to do after they consume your content? Are you trying to get them to buy a product? Are you trying to get them to subscribe? Are you trying to get them to engage? Are you trying to get them to take some kind of action, like write their legislator or register to vote? Are you trying to get them to make a donation? 
because you always want to focus what you're creating around the end goal. You know, if you want to monetize those things as heavily as possible, if your goal is monetization, then the, as specific as, as you can make it, the better, because you'll be able to go way deeper and provide much higher quality focused content. If you just want to create for the sake of creation to explore your own interests, um, do whatever you want, right? And like everything in between. <laughs> so it comes back to just first being really uh, able to focus on what your brand voice, identity, what you want, what your goals are, what you want your audience to do. And then for follow up on that, I've seen some where they have like a YouTube presence, let's say. Mm -hmm. And then they've got like merch, like t-shirts, mm -hmm. mugs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, are those really beneficial and profitable or? Sometimes. Sometimes? Um, sometimes. I, I mean, if, if you've got a, a connection with somebody and they really like your stuff, like the Try Guys are a great I was example. just going to say Try Guys. Um, I, I, I have not bought a Triceratops hoodie, but I've definitely thought about it. <laughs> Same. Um, it's just about that connection that you have with your audience. I think you're more likely to be successful once you have, with merch specifically, once you have that audience and that relationship and then introduce merch versus starting yeah. with trying to push them a product because then it, it feels too So harsh. focus on building. Mm -hmm. And honestly, people will ask you for what they want. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if you're doing a good job building a community and building your accounts, at some point in time, people will be like, "You need? I need a T-shirt. I need a hoodie. You the, should make a journal. You the should write it up." On TikTok mm -hmm. with the with the dough, mm -hmm. legs in, arms in. People will ask you for what less they want. If you're paying yeah. attention, you won't be able to get. Them. So if you build a YouTube channel around this personal brand, yes. you know, community and all that Yes. Uh, you know, that with Chuck, he sells coffee sometimes mm -hmm. on his channel. Mm -hmm. So you can build a personal YouTube channel mm -hmm. about yourself. And you continue to do what you're doing. When you make a video for photography, it'll be on a photography uh, post. And you can you know, have other people use facets of your uh, videos for different uh, aspects of things that they're doing. So you can build a YouTube channel around you as a person. Mm -hmm. And to come back to that, some people don't realize what the actual common denominator is. Like we tend to think about, oh, cooking is a thing. Try Guys are a great example. They do not have a niche as far as like cooking. Their niche is trying new things, mm -hmm. right? So. You can have a niche of um, interviewing, like Guy Kawasaki has his Remarkable People podcast. The niche is people doing cool things that I want to talk to. Um, there's a, Medians and cars getting coffee. Yes, there's another podcast called it's Ologies podcast. that's all about every different kind of specialist. Like I list, I listen to an entire podcast about scurritology, which is the study of squirrels. I know so I love much that about podcast. squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> it's so right? cool. um, So sometimes you know the the niche is ways to make a difference in the world, where the niche is um, being a more kind, compassionate human. And it can, like, there are many, many different ways to categorize things, other than the obvious things that we think of as a niche, or that people talk about as a niche in, like, the online world. Um, and so if you can find the common denominator, the thread, the through line, and then you can make that clear to your audience, and they're going to show up again. You'll find well, you'll find those that percentage of the eight billion that are mm -hmm. like you're my type of person. Have you ever explored personal branding versus business branding? That might kind of mm -hmm. dig in there a little bit. Sort of. Sort of. Or that. I mean, I, I, mean, I started a few years ago with doing online uh, training classes on Udemy, and I went with Atomic Super Geek because it was all computer things. Mm -hmm. so. mm -hmm. Yes. This is awesome. Mm -hmm. Like for real, lots of information. I just want to expand on <clears throat> everything we've gotten thus far. What is, if, it, if there is, what's the fourth trend we're seeing? Oh, what's the fourth trend? Wow. That's a really good question. Wow. Let me think about that one for a minute. 
Um, speed. Speed. Um, if you look at technology over the last hundred years, and you look at like time to adoption for radio, for TV, for like computers, for social media, that window is going down, 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 down. It's a big, it's a big challenge for education. As a mom to teenagers, it's a big challenge for me as a parent to be like, how do I raise my kids to be ready for um, jobs that in 10 years that don't even, even exist today? Self-development as a human being. Um, hone your ability to learn hone your ability to adapt, hone your ability to ask questions. I, so my very first big girl job, real job, whatever you want to call it, I was working at McDonald's and this person came in for the lunch rush and there was a problem with their fries. Anyway, they really liked how I solved their problem and like, Later on down the line, there may have been some sexism involved, but we won't discuss that. But they decided to hire me for their trucking company. Like literally from McDonald's, they were like, come in for an interview, we'll hire you, you'll make twice as much money as you don't care. The f I knew nothing about trucking or logistics. Like I was 16 years old. I was a freshman in college. I knew nothing. The first day on the job, I, can't, I literally had to ask somebody what the difference between a truck and a trip was. And I think those trips, <laughs> you know, anybody who knows about the trucking industry, okay? <laughs> um, I excelled. I advanced as far as I could in the job. Um, and by the end of two years, when the, I decided to move on and do other things, my boss, when a reference called, they're like, she's the most terrible person ever. Sorry, I had to say that because I really want to keep her. Um, that is solely because I, it has always been a skill set of mine to ask questions. Like, most people would not have gone up and just been like, what's the difference between a truck and a, they didn't even give me my own desk for the first three months because everybody other than the person who hired me, who they fired six weeks later, by the way, was just like, this little girl who knows nothing is gone. And we're trying to sabotage you. I had to like wait for people to go on smoke breaks, go on lunch, to go grab their desk and use their computer. <laughs> That's the skill set we need for the next, the next trend of things, is the willingness to try, make mistakes, learn, grow, hold ourselves accountable when we do it and keep going. It's only going to get faster and faster and faster. We can do it, we can adapt, um, but it's a completely different skill set than what we have used for the last 50 years. Just, okay. just, to, yeah. just to add to it real quick, it's, I don't know, I may be looking around, I may be the oldest person in this room. Um, when I first started at computers in the 1970s, we didn't even have video displays on our computers. You, you output it to a print, and we input it through key punch cards. When I got serious in computers in the late 80s, I was pulling out five megabyte hard drives to put in a whopping huge 20 megabyte hard drive. And we thought that was just amazing. And we had computers that didn't even have hard drives in them. I just put a four terabyte hard drive on my computer. I, I, that, that was unthinkable back in the day. And, it, and like she said, it's just getting faster. Thanks everybody for being here. Yes, it's been a really big hand. Lakeshore Advantage.com. Um, we have an events tab. You can see all, all that's happening. And if you want to be notified, we have a um, email list you can sign up for. You'll get notification of our events. Thank you. Do you have virtual events too? Um, not as much as we did a couple years ago. <laughs> 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 so 